This lecture is going to cover a little bit of an introduction to looking at chest x-rays, and then we're going to go into some, um, some examples of, of x-ray findings uh, with particular focus on ICU portable um, chest x-rays. Uh, there's obviously a lot to cover when it comes to the chest x-ray, um, such as mediastinal lines and stripes and clear spaces, uh, which I'm not specifically going to talk about in this uh, lecture. So, um, you know, when you're starting to learn how to read chest x-rays, um, you want to have a consistent search pattern every time. As you gain more and more experience, you'll be able to look at uh, the x-ray and get a gestalt um, impression that you can just dictate directly. But when you're starting out, you really want to develop a consistent search pattern. And I'll kind of go through uh, one that I, that I tend to use. Um, you don't want to forget about looking at all the lines and devices, um, and you don't want to forget looking at the so-called edge of the film, that is, the bones, the shoulders, the abdomen, uh, everything that's included in the image. So here's an example of a normal chest x-ray. Now, I tend to start looking at the devices. This patient doesn't have any. And then I look at the lungs. And, you know, uh, one of your best friends when looking at the lungs is symmetry. Um, the lungs are not exactly symmetric, but generally, particularly on the x-ray, you can just see that um, the lungs should be equally clear from side to side. So I often try to sort of scan them from side to side like this to look for any nodules or airspace disease um, or other asymmetric uh, findings, which I can then try to figure out. The other thing then you want to look at it next is, um, of course, pleural findings and then the mediastinum. Um, so of course, here is the heart and we've got the hyalur structures here. And just remember that you should be able to see through all of these structures, um, the way that the X chest x-ray technique is done, we can see through all of these structures. So you can see the normal vessels behind the heart, for example. Um, you really uh, want to look for uh, your ability to see through all of these things. The highlight should also be relatively symmetric in density. Um, and, uh, and so don't forget that there's the sort of hidden spots, hidden blind spots um, on the x-ray are the apices behind the mediastinum, as I mentioned, and then behind the hemidiaphragms. Uh, once you've looked through all of that, also you should remember that um, there are several lines, and we're not going to go through all of them here, but there are several lines that should always be visible. So here we have the di hemidiaphragms, we've got the heart borders, both uh, right and left heart borders, descending aorta, um, and sometimes you can see the paravertebral lines, not always. Um, so here are those lines I didn't mention, but this is the azigoesophageal recess, uh, which you can see in most x-rays. Um, and there's the AP window. So anyway, you want to make sure that you can trace all of these lines on all of the x-rays. If a line disappears at some point, that means that there's either a mass there or it's being silhouetted by, for example, uh, pleural effusion or airspace disease. And here is the lateral chest x-ray, uh, which many of us find more challenging. But uh, you want to, again, just remember that there are certain clear spaces here that you should be able to see through. Uh, so there's the retrosternal clear space, this retrocardiac clear space, and then the spine, which isn't exactly clear, but it should get uh, more loosened as you go inferiorly. Um, and I'm not going to talk here about how to evaluate the hilum um, on the lateral view that uh, would really sort of merits its own discussion. So let's jump into some examples of lung disease. Again, somewhat of a focus on what you might see on portable x-rays or ICU x-rays. So here we have a patient where there is an abnormality in the interstitium. Now, getting a gestalt of this, it takes a lot of practice until you'll know that this is an abnormal amount of interstitial markings compared to this case where the interstitium is normal. So again, practice will make perfect, but here you can really hang your hat on, this is just a zoomed in version here, you can really hang your hat on the presence of these small horizontal lines that touch the pleural surface. These are, of course, curly B lines. So this patient has interstitial pulmonary edema. The pulmonary edema obviously has a spectrum from the very mildest edema where you see curly B lines. Um, you may also see a little bit of fluid or thickening of the pleural uh, of the fissures. Um, you'll progress to having indistinct pulmonary vasculature. Um, remember that in a normal chest x-ray, you should be able to see the margins of the pulmonary vessels crisply. 
But when the patients develop pulmonary edema, those become kind of fuzzy and it's hard to exactly define where the edge of the pulmonary vessels are. As the edema worsens, you develop perihilar airspace opacities, like in this case, you see just haziness and indistinctness of both hyla and just this hazy airspace opacity uh, in the central parts of both lungs. Uh, ba the bases also tend to be involved with pulmonary edema. And then in more severe edema, you'll have sort of more confluent, dense airspace opacities, um, even progressing to uh, almost whiteout in some cases. So here's a more severe example of pulmonary edema, and these arrows are just pointing to a pleural effusion. Now, the other clues that a process uh, is pulmonary edema compared to other inter sort of diffuse uh, interstitial airspace processes is that these patients often have cardiomegaly and they often have uh, pleural effusions. And of course, the finding would also be acute if you have priors to compare with. Um, there are other uh, entities that can simulate pulmonary edema. There is non-cardiogenic edema, um, probably more commonly used terms now would be acute uh, lung injury or diffuse alveolar damage, um, but you can have just pure um, edema that's caused by non-cardiogenic causes, and these patients tend not to have pleural effusions, and they tend to have normal heart size, um, and they often do not have septal thickening or curly B lines, although that's, um, that may be present. And in some cases, you'll see sparing of the immediate subpleural lung. Now, in this particular case, I know the answer because this patient um, had a severe brain injury, um, but had no reason to have pulmonary edema. Uh, and so this was a neuro cause of neurogenic uh, cause of uh, non-cardiogenic edema. This is another case of a non-cardiogenic edema pattern where you have bilateral perihilar predominant airspace disease um, that's symmetric. Uh, but in this case, we have a normal heart size and no pleural effusions. And this turned out to be a case of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage in a patient with good pasture syndrome. So again, if you see something that looks like edema, but the patient doesn't have any good clinical reason to have edema, the heart size is normal and there are no pleural effusions, you should think of um, some kind of non-cardiogenic edema pattern, which can include non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from neurogenic causes, for example, it can include alveolar hemorrhage, it can include um, diffuse alveolar damage in the setting of ARDS. Now, this is an example of lung disease that is quite asymmetric. Not only is it asymmetric in its density, but it sort of is multifocal rather than a diffuse process. Um, as we can see here, involvement of the right upper lobe. Um, you can see it's bounded by the minor fissure here. And then some patchy airspace disease in the left mid lung zone as well. So whenever you see asymmetric lung findings, you want to th think about non uh, you know, things other than pulmonary edema. Now, of course, pulmonary edema can be asymmetric if the patient is um, has one side down for some reason or in the setting of mitral regurgitation where you can sometimes have asymmetric edema involving the right lung and various other post-surgical causes that can uh, result in asymmetric pulmonary edema. But for the most part, when you see findings that are asymmetric, you wanna think about other causes and particularly if you have findings where there's quite dense consolidation. So this was just a case of multifocal pneumonia. Here's another pneumonia, and this is a good example of not only focal and asymmetric airspace disease, but also um, the point that I was making earlier about looking behind the heart. So you can see here in this case, there is, um, you cannot see lung markings behind the heart, but there's a dense consolidation. You can see a little bit of vessels more superiorly here, but then they lead into this dense opacity. It's a part, of course, a lot more uh, obvious on the lateral view where we have this so-called spine sign. In other words, the uh, lungs become denser as you move down. So this is a left lower lobe pneumonia. Now there are other causes, of course, of asymmetric lung disease. And in this case, we see that the left hemithorax is nearly completely whited out, um, but we see that the mediastinum has shifted towards that side, so we cannot see the heart at all. There's some tracheal shift as well. Now granted, this patient is somewhat rotated, so the tracheal shift um, is exaggerated by that fact. But at any rate, um, the mediastinal shift towards the left uh, with, in the setting of whiteout would imply atelectasis. You can also see that there's some cutoff of the left main stem bronchus, which we can follow here, but then cannot follow more distally. So this was a case of left lung near, com near complete collapse, secondary to mucus plugging. There's probably some aspiration in the right lung in this case as well.
Now, shifting gears a little bit to plural uh, abnormalities, um, here is an example of a unilateral whiteout, but in which the mediastinum has shifted towards the other side. We also see some tracheal shift to the other side. So this means that there must be a space occupying process in the right hemithorax, which is almost always going to be a pleural effusion if it's that large. But occasionally you can have masses that large. Here is another example of pleural effusion, in this case tracking in the minor fissure here. Um, sometimes it can create sort of a mass-like appearance and is referred to as a pseudotumor by some people. Um, here we can see um, on the CT, uh, just a nice correlate for that um, component of fluid in the major fissure. There was also a loculated comp component um, more basally as well. Now this patient also has a right pleural effusion. Um, and we all, while we can see a little bit of in the, in the minor fissure, there's actually quite a large effusion, uh, which is somewhat hidden from us. You can see that what looks like the right hemidiaphragm is elevated compared to the left side. However, this does not have the normal shape of the diaphragm but instead tends to peak more laterally here, whereas the normal hemidiaphragm should have its peak in the middle. So this is known as a subpulmonic effusion, where the pleural effusion is collecting just inferior to the lung, and so we, here we can see that a CT that was done at the same time shows a very large pleural effusion on the side. So if you ever see that what looks like the diaphragm doesn't have the right shape, um, you want to think about things like subpulmonic effusions. The other thing to think about would be lobar atelectasis, which can sometimes simulate the hemidiaphragm, but again, would not have the right shape. Okay, shifting gears to abnormal air collections in the thorax. So here we have an air fluid level. You should never see air fluid levels um, anywhere in the chest under normal circumstances. So uh, that should always clue you into the presence of something which is usually a hydronemothorax, as it is in this case. You can see actually here's the medial margin, uh, the medial pleural margin of the lung. There's also kind of a lateral one here, which is a little more difficult to see. So this is a hydronemothorax. Remember that if we had a lateral view here, the, um, the line, the air fluid level line would be generally is much shorter in one view and much longer in the other view, just because of the shape of the pleural space being uh, elliptical. Whereas uh, air fluid levels in the lung parenchyma within a lung abscess uh, would generally be, um, since abscesses tend to be spherical, you'll have about the same width on the frontal and lateral views. Here is an example of a tension pneumothorax, which should be pretty obvious. We've got mediastinal shift towards the left and of course a large air collection here. Notice also that this diaphragm is, hemidiaphragm is depressed. And here we have another example of a pneumothorax um, and this case illustrates the so-called deep sulcus science. You can see lucency here, abnormal lucency down in the right base. And that's because in a supine patient, air collects anteriorly, and the most anterior part of the hemithorax is actually the, um, the, the more inferior part. So air can collect down here and cause a deep sulcus sign. You can also see here is the pleural reflection more superiorly, but um, just based on the initial gestalt, it's, it's probably more obvious to see the lucency here than it is to, to pick out this small pleural line where there's a lot of overlying tubes and devices. Um, here's another abnormal air collection. This is in the pericardium. Um, you can see that this air, of course, nicely outlines the pericardial sac. One imaging uh, clue that it's pericardial, not mediastinal, besides, of course, the fact that in this case, it's very obviously bounded by the pericardium, um, is that pericardium is a true space. And so when air fills it, it'll be um, totally lucent, whereas pneumomediastinum, like in this case, tends to look quite streaky because it's air dissecting within multiple tissue planes rather than filling a true space. Also, pneumomediastinum will tend to track uh, cranially into the neck and, and sub, uh, subcutaneous soft tissues, whereas, of course, pneumopericardium will be bounded by the pericardial reflections. And this is another example of abnormal air, uh, in this case, pneumoperitoneum under the right hemidiaphragm. Um, one thing I'm not showing a case of here, but a, a sign that's helpful in abnormal air is uh, the so-called continuous diaphragm sign. And we don't see it in this case, but you should never see uh, what looks like the diaphragm across the spine. Um, so if you were to see that, that would clue you into the fact that there would be abnormal air, um, but it could be either pneumopericardium, pneumomediastinum, or pneumoperitoneum.
All right, we're going to cover a few devices very briefly. Um, you'll become familiar with a lot more devices uh, through your practice, but here's an example of an endotracheal tube that's malpositioned. So here we have the ET tube going down the trachea, but then going into the right main stem bronchus. Again, we've got left lung collapse with leftward mediastinal shift, uh, which is caused by hy hypoinflation of the left lung. Of course, here is the nasogastric tube, which is correctly placed. Um, but in this case, this uh, enteric feeding tube is incorrectly placed. You can see that it starts off over the central mediastinum, but then takes this angle towards the right here, and then goes into the region of the lung parenchyma, and then actually loops up and terminates in the uh, right apex. Now, this must have perforated the lung and gone into the pleural space. Um, usually, the tubes stop somewhere in this region uh, once the patient starts coughing, uh, and then does can just be removed without any adverse effects. But if the tube is inserted all the way and punctures the pleura, then usually these patients will need a chest tube placed to, uh, to drain that pneumothorax because it, it tends to be quite a large hole that's made by one of these tubes. You can see there already is a small pneumothorax in the apex in this case. Um, this was a case of central line placement that went awry. You can see that there's a line here that doesn't look normal. Now it's sometimes hard to tell where the entry site is. In this case, you can see this sort of blunt end of the line here. This is the um, skin, the skin site, uh, the site where all the connections are made. Um, so this was a subclavian line that unfortunately went up into the internal jugular vein in the neck. Um, so it's always important to trace these lines. Any line that, um, that you're not sure what it is, you should trace. And after a while, you get used to seeing these EKG leads, which you can just ignore. Um, but sometimes it'll, it's, it's sometimes hard to pick up lines like this, which are not going in the expected position, because you might think that they're outside the patient. But in this case, it was a subclavian line. Here's another example of a misplaced line, in this case, a pick. We can see it traveling from the arm. Uh, then it takes this very high, abnormally high course over the clavicle. The subclavian vein should travel just above the first rib uh, where it passes over the clavicle. Um, so the artery actually has a much higher course. So this, it would worry you. And of course, as we continue to follow this, we can see that this line crosses midline and terminates here in the region of the aortic knob. And so this was an arterially placed pick. Anytime you have an arterially placed line, um, you generally will want to evaluate where it entered the artery. If it's like in this case with this pick, it just entered the artery directly um, in the arm, then that's something that's easy to fix by just pulling out the line holding pressure. If you have more centrally placed lines like an IJ or a subclavian, um, sometimes those can enter the artery in the mediastinum or deep supraclavicular fossae, uh, and it's nearly impossible to hold pressure in those locations. So those, uh, in that situation, you'll often get a CT to see where the arterial puncture site is, um, and that may require surgical intervention. If you have any questions about uh, the devices you see, uh, I'll direct you to my website, linestubes.com. Um, I have a whole bunch of different devices with lots of images, uh, and so that might be helpful to you. So to summarize, when you're approaching a chest x-ray, you should always have a system and use that same system every time. Uh, that will just prevent you from missing things. Use symmetry, um, symmetry in the lungs in particular, but also um, in general, our body tends to be symmetric. Um, trace all of the lines and devices that you see, and don't forget the edges of the film. You might pick up um, an abnormally placed line, you might pick up pneumoperitoneum um, or some musculoskeletal abnormality. All right, thanks, I hope this was helpful.